Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. My name is Julia Flynn Seiler, and I'm so delighted to be the moderator for today's program. As a nonfiction author and a journalist myself, as well as a juror for the club's California Book Awards program, I am so pleased to welcome Susan Orlean to the Commonwealth Club for the first time. Susan, of course, is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of 11 books, including the library book, which was the California Book Awards 2019 gold medal winner in nonfiction. So we're here to discuss Susan's wonderful new book on animals, a collection of essays on a range of furry and burly creatures. Susan, I'm just delighted to welcome you to the Commonwealth Club. Now, one quick note before we jump in. If you have a question for Susan or for me, please put them in the YouTube chat feature and they will be forwarded to me during the program. Uh, Susan, let's get animal-ish, uh, yeah. as you call, yeah, yeah, as you call the, in the introduction to your book on animals. So oh, just, I'm so I'm so happy to be with you and, and delighted to be part of this program. Oh, thank you. Well, we're so thrilled to have you, Susan. So tell us, why have you been drawn to writing about animals for so many years? This is a question that has quite a few answers. Um, for one thing, I like animals. And so the opportunity to be around them is one that's hard for me to resist. Secondly, I think because I do like animals, I notice them in the world more than perhaps another writer would. The story that catches my attention because I like animals might go unnoticed by someone who simply doesn't have their antenna tuned to that frequency. I've also really liked the opportunity to write about humans through the lens of animals. And these stories, as much as they are about animals, are very much about people. There really is hardly an animal on this planet that isn't in some fashion affected by human civilization. And the stories that I've been drawn to most are those stories in which our interface with the animal world is very much what the story is about, how we manage coexisting with this alternate universe. Absolutely. So, Susan, is it true that you wrote your very first book at a very young age? And if so, what was that book about? Well, according to family legend, I was only five years old and I'm not going to necessarily deliver that as gospel truth, but I was definitely young. It was a book titled Herbert the Nearsighted Pigeon. And all the characters in it were animals, which of course to me seemed very natural. Uh, it just seemed like this was a world populated by all of these different interesting creatures. In this case, Herbert was a pigeon who was feeling um, like his relationships with his friends were, were not going well and he couldn't understand why. Eventually he goes to an optometrist and discovers that he needs glasses and that <laughs> what had been happening is he didn't even recognize his friends because he couldn't see them clearly. So all is well in the world once Herbert gets his glasses. Oh. And I, you know, it's a story that um, 
First of all, I think it's interesting that rather than the protagonist being another little girl, which is what I was at the time, or a princess or whatever you think the fantasy life of a five-year-old would would be, instead it was a a sad pigeon who was having relationship problems and his relationships were with all of these other animals. Now, children's literature, of course, is filled with animals. So the stories that I was reading, the stories I grew up on were populated largely by animals. So it's not out of the blue that I would also craft my own book filled with animals, but it, it definitely was where my imagination, my imaginative life resided was in the world of animals. Well, it probably gave your hint, uh, your family a hint of what was to come uh, and the wonderful things you would write about. So in this book, Susan, your most recent on animals, would you please read us the beginning of your essays show dog? Uh, because it so beautifully illustrates not only your spectacular sense of humor, but also the way you see the world of humans through animals. I would love to. Uh, This is one of my favorite stories to do, and it's called Show Dog. If I were a bitch, I'd be in love with Biff Truesdale. Biff is perfect. He's friendly, good looking, rich, famous, and in excellent physical condition. He almost never drools. He's not afraid of commitment. He wants children. Actually, he already has children and wants a lot more. He works hard and is a consummate professional, but he also knows how to have fun. What Biff likes most is food and sex. This makes him sound boorish, but he is not. He's just elemental. Food he likes even better than sex. His favorite things to eat are cookies, mints, and hotel soap, but he will eat just about anything. Richard Krieger, a friend of Biff's who occasionally drives him to appointments, said not long ago, when we're driving on I-95, we'll usually pull over at McDonald's. Even if Biff is napping, he usually wakes up when we're getting close. I get him a few plain hamburgers with buns, no ketchup, no mustard, and no pickles. He loves hamburgers. I don't get him his own French fries, but if I get myself fries, I always flip a few for him into the back. If you're ever around Biff while you're eating something he wants to taste, cold roast beef, a Wheatables cracker, chocolate, pasta, aspirin, whatever, He will stare at you across the pleated bridge of his nose and let his eyes sag and his lips tremble and allow a little bead of drool to percolate at the edge of his mouth until you feel so crummy that you give him a taste. This routine puts the people who know him in a quandary because Biff needs to keep an eye on his weight. Usually he is as skinny as Kate Moss, but he can put on three pounds in an instant. The holidays can be tough. He takes time off at Christmas and spends it at home in Attleboro, Massachusetts, where there's a lot of food around and no pressure and no schedule. And it's easy to eat all day. Any extra weight goes to his neck. Luckily, Biff likes working out. He runs for 15 or 20 minutes twice a day, either outside or on his jog master. When he's feeling heavy, he runs longer and skips snacks until he's down to his ideal weight of 75 pounds. Biff is a boxer. He is a show dog. He performs under the name Champion High Techs Arbitrage. Looking good is not mere vanity, it's business. A show dog's career is short and judges are unforgiving. Each breed is judged by an exacting standard for appearance and temperament. And then there's the incalculable element of charisma in the ring. When a show dog is fat or lazy or sullen, he doesn't win. When he doesn't win, he doesn't enjoy the ancillary benefits of being a winner. 
such as appearing as the celebrity spokesmodel on packages of pred- pedigree mealtime with lamb and rice, which Biff will be doing soon, or picking the best looking bitches and charging them $600 or so for his sexual favors, which Biff does three or four times a month. Another ancillary benefit of being a winner is that almost every single weekend of the year, as he travels to shows around the country, he gets to hear people applaud for him and yell his name and tell him what a good boy he is, which is something he seems to enjoy at least as much as eating a bar of soap. That's so, so funny. I love that first line. If I were a bitch, I'd be in love with Bip Truesdale. So well, I felt I felt like this was the one and only opportunity to make that elementary school joke about the use of the word bitch to mean a female dog. And I laughed myself sick as I was writing it because I thought Good. this is I am using this joke once and it can never be used again. <laughs> Well, it also sounds like something you might come up and, you know, you're having cocktails with friends and you're joking about what you did that day. And uh, yeah, you know, I hung out with Biff and we were talking about the bitches he'd visited. And uh, so anyways, how did you come up with that opening line and what was the inspiration for this amazing story? I was um, I've always been a fan of watching the Westminster dog show and It was a month or so before the show. And I just was idly thinking about the dogs that are in the show and thought to myself, I wonder, given that these are dogs who are worth all sorts of money, who have to always look good. I thought, I wonder if they are also still in a very fundamental way. Dogs, do they do they chase their tails? Do they play with balls in the backyard? What? What is their life actually like? Many of these dogs are live with their handlers. They don't even own with uh, live with the people who own them. They they have very rare, rarefied lives. It just struck me as a really interesting story to write, to examine what the day to day life would be like to be a dog that was such a high performance creature when in the meantime, my dog was asleep on the sofa and, you know, chasing rabbits in her dreams and being just a very regular dog. Once I decided I wanted to do that story, I knew that I wanted to shape it the way you might shape a human celebrity profile, that I would apply the same sort of template to writing this story as you might in writing about a supermodel who were the people who tended to this creature's well-being did they worry about their weight and their hair it it seemed what do they do on their day off do they ever eat takeout chinese i mean all of those questions that we have about people whose appearance is their business struck me as fascinating It's also true that a dog is a dog is a dog. And I met this dog who I had zeroed in on him because I I began asking around who who was the top show dog in the U.S., who was a contender for best in show. And his name came up regularly. I'm not a particular fan of boxer dogs. I love dogs, but that's not a breed that I am particularly drawn to, but I met this dog. He really had charisma. First of all, he was beautiful. Secondly, he was charming. He was delightful. I, I genuinely fell in love with him. I thought, you know, this is kind of the er dog. He, he's like good looking and strong and, and he makes a good living and, You know, I began thinking of him in terms that that you might as you were going through a dating app, like this is a good match. Look at this guy. He's got a great job. He's good looking. He's in shape. And it just suddenly felt very personal that 
that writing the story from the idea that I was really charmed by this dog as a celebrity who was also really approachable. I mean, this dog sniffed my butt. I mean, what could be more approachable? So oh, you're it, making it, me laugh. The, the it difference, became, though. I mean, it felt the the lead just sort of popped into my head and it felt instantly like where I had to go. Well, it brilliance. And and you know, the the challenges I imagine, of course, is unlike a supermodel, you couldn't really interview Biff, could you? You couldn't get into his interior life. You could only observe him and put together this profile of him from his behavior. And, well, uh, this is the great challenge, of course, writing about animals and part of the magic, um, but definitely the challenge is your inability to to be in their mind, to and certainly in the case of not being able to speak to them. I mean, this is as journalists, what we're used to doing, which is interviewing people and getting loads of quotes. And of course, the story, like all of these stories, was as much about the people who see to Biff's magnificence as as it was about Biff. But there was a, a moment of reckoning when I spent time alone with Biff thinking now I'm really going to get to the heart of the matter, really get to know him as an individual. And there we were alone. And I just had to finally acknowledge, Oh, right. Dogs don't talk. This is not going to go anywhere. And, and it, you know, that's part of what makes thinking about animals so interesting is there's no mediating um, kind of presence, even of speech. It's, it's a very direct reaction to the animal's behavior, the way you feel when you see the animal, the way the animal acts when they see you. Um, but also the way the people around the animal respond to it, care for it, fantasize about it, project onto it, all of that. And, and it's in a way very, very nuanced and complex because we're different species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we approached a political reporting like that, not uh, taking interviewing politicians, not listening to spin doctors, but purely focusing on their behavior and our observations. Um, but another another one of the essays that kind of explore like like uh, the show dog essay, um, the deeper theme of how humans relate to animals is Where's Willie? And this is an essay about um, a killer whale that featured in the Free Willy movies. And it is an astonishing, another astonishing essay. You never actually saw Willie. Um, so I wanted to ask you the question, how did you go about reporting the world around him, the people around him? Well, this is really one of my favorite stories. And I suppose I can say that about all of these stories because I feel very attached to each one of them. But this, the, Where's Willie was such a fascinating saga. Where I began with it was just trying to piece together the timeline of this one orca's life. This was an animal that had a truly extraordinary experience of having been born in the wild, captured when he was just a baby, first was in an aquarium in Iceland, then was moved to an aquarium in Mexico, then starred in this movie that was a blockbuster, went back to his aquarium in Mexico and suddenly was buoyed up by a huge public outcry, which was this is a movie about a, an orca in captivity who is released back into the wild. That is the freeing of Willie, the whale in the movie. Producers had no anticipation of what came next, which was people were saying, wait a minute, what happened to the whale who played Willie in the movies? Where is he? Well, the answer was he was in a crummy aquarium 
in Mexico, living alone and being very, um, very sad. Even the, the aquarium knew he was sad. He was the only whale. He was in a small body of water there. And he was not thriving. He was actually, it, his physical condition was very poor, probably because of stress and um, inadequate conditions. Well, millions of dollars are required to do anything with an orca and millions of dollars were contributed by people who saw the movie and wanted to free Kate. His name is Keiko. His real name is Keiko. His stage name was Willie. But um, the viewers of the movie who loved the mu movie were saying, wait a minute, this isn't fair. In the movie, you're celebrating an orca being released into the wild, we should do that for Keiko. Well, it's not so simple. This was an animal who had been in captivity since a very early age. And he didn't really know how to be a wild whale. First, he was flown to Oregon, where he was kept in a much improved aquarium situation, but he was still in captivity and people weren't satisfied. There was still this drum roll of demand. This whale should be released into the wild. And it was a very heartfelt emotion, but also one that was unfortunately not grounded in a lot of reality, namely that an animal that's captured at a young age is not easily reintroduced into the wild. Um, you know, we, we've certainly seen instances of it and it's all, it's wonderful when it happens, but it, it isn't always successful. It had never been done with an orca. So the idea that we were going to do it for the first time with Keiko was one that was fraught with um, potential problems. So Keiko was then moved from Oregon to Iceland, which is uh, where he was originally captured, was off the coast of Iceland. Many, many millions of dollars spent. First of all, it's not easy to fly an orca from Oregon to Iceland. So, you know, mere fact you have to buy, among other things, millions of gallons of Vaseline to lubricate the whale as he's traveling by plane to Iceland. <laughs> I mean, that fact alone was, you know, for a reporter, a dream come true. The amount of Vaseline they needed to lubricate him. But also, Keiko wasn't all that interested in being wild anymore. He, he really liked eating frozen fish. He was very, very comfortable with humans. He loved hanging out with his handlers. He, they would open the pen to let him take a walk in the ocean alone. And he wasn't so interested in doing it. So this, the story brought up so many issues and this is why it was one that I, really enjoyed doing, which is what does being wild mean? What does captivity mean? What do we owe to the animals that we capture? What, what is the sort of moral meaning of spending millions of dollars on one individual animal? I mean, is that the right thing to do? Is it wrongheaded? What, what animal is, is it possible for us not to fall in love with? Well, you would sort of think, how do you fall in love with a whale? Well, people fell in love with this whale. So I would say there is no animal. I mean, you would think of a whale and how big they are and our sense of orcas as being killer whales. Although there's only been one whale orca in captivity who's ever killed a human. And it was one, the, one whale who killed two different people, but otherwise we've never known them to be, to have any particular interest in killing humans. Nevertheless, 
they're gigantic. I mean, can you feel emotionally connected to this gigantic animal? The people around Keiko were smitten with him and felt an enormous connection to him. So the story had uh, a million octopus arms. There were so many subjects that it touched on. And I will say that I had gone back after I finished the story to Iceland and to Norway, and I did actually meet Orca. Uh, met, I met Keiko after I had finished the story. <laughs> and it was almost, um, it was sort of reassuring to see that you could meet this gigantic animal and feel some sort of tug emotionally that is hard to describe. It defies logic, perhaps, but it definitely exists. Mm -hmm. At what point did you enter the story in your reporting? I mean, how far along was the effort to free Keiko uh, from, you know, and reintroduce him to the wild when you came into the story? He was um, in Iceland. So it was, you know, a number of years into the story. And he had been in Iceland for a while and they were already in the process of letting him get out of his pen and visit with wild whales. And as it happened, the day I arrived happened to be the day that instead of coming back to his pen after visiting with wild whales. This was the first time ever that he stayed with the wild whales. What he had been doing up until that point is he would go out and play with the whales or mostly observe the whales. And then after a while, he would come back and follow the boat back to the base. And this was the first time that he didn't follow the boat back and instead continued on with this pod of whales and he eventually ended up in Norway. And if you think whales are smart, they are very smart, but Norway <laughs> is the one country in the world that where whaling is legal. So, you know, in part, not so smart. And there were people in Norway who said, well, we should, we should harpoon him. He's a, he's a whale and we, oh, no. we <laughs> hunt whales here. Um, but fortunately, that did not happen. But Susan, it's so extraordinary. I, you know, it's a perfect example of reporter's luck that you arrived at that moment where he was for the first time free. He had joined, you know, made the decision to keep on joining the pod and move on and, and leave his captors. And it's incredible to reach the end of the story. And then you basically reconstructed it from the beginning up until that point. Right. I, I mean, it was pure uh, coincidence. Um, in fact, I had fully expected that I would arrive and I would see Keiko and I would observe him being taken care of. So when I first arrived and I was told, well, actually, he didn't come home yesterday. My reaction was, oh, no, my story is ruined. And, you know, this I'm sure you know that feeling where you think, well, forget it. I'm it's ruined. I can't do it. I'm I guess I'll go home. And then you take a beat and you think, well, actually, this is a, a really interesting moment to be writing about it. And this is certainly an example of how much these stories are about people, because I was mostly interacting with the people who and there was a large crew of people who were invested in this whale's well-being and they were all on site trying to figure out where is he going is he okay is he hungry is he lost so the story focused very much on on this large kind of posse that existed around this one whale's life Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I'm trying, I'm struggling to come up with the, I, I'm sure you have a way of describing it, but it, I, like everybody, loved your book, The Orchid Thief, was, which was made into the movie adaptation. And, uh, you know, that book is about obsession. It's about passion. It's about 
the natural world and somebody who is obsessed with um, an aspect of it. What's the parallel with, for example, um, Where's Willie? Is it similarly passionate people? Is it this interface between the wild and the free or the wild and the captive? Uh, I think it's all of those things. I I'm certainly fascinated by passion. I'm fascinated by people who have organized their life around a very singular item or pursuit. I'm perhaps most fascinated by people who have focused their life around a living thing. Because as in the case of the orchid thief, you know, you can be an orchid collector, but every minute that's a changeable phenomenon. You, you don't buy an orchid and have it in its perfect state forever. They're living things. They die. They get fungus. They, you know, they wilt. They, they need care. They are, it's a, you don't ever truly own them as much as you accept your stewardship of them. And the, the desire to collect a living thing is one that can never be requited. So it, it's particularly interesting to me. I mean, people collect anything you can think of. And if somebody decides they're going to be a cast iron skillet collector, it's interesting, but it's also a very static thing. You collect these cast iron skillets. When you buy one, you have it. It doesn't change. It doesn't age. It doesn't die. But collecting a living thing or, or focusing your life around a living thing, you're entering something that's fraught with the possibility of heartbreak of change, of evolution. And in the case of Keiko, he died. Um, he came back from Norway. He caught pneumonia. And he, he, he was probably in his mid-30s, which is a little bit on the young side. And he died and people were bereft. And there was this whole complicated infrastructure that had been built all around Keiko. It wasn't built around wild whales of the world. It was built around one individual whale. And it was almost as if nobody had ever grappled with the intractable fact that someday he would die. It, it was as if that reality just didn't enter the equation. So it, it's particularly fascinating to me and def uh, colored my entire writing of The Orchid Thief was imagining what it would feel like to have a fascination with a species that could, for one thing, we don't even know how many orchids there are in the world. So those people who have this desire to have one of every species, well, they will never achieve that. And maybe that's part of the point. Maybe part of the, the draw is the imperfectibility of it, mm -hmm. that collecting cast iron skillets is a bit of a dead end. You collect them and it's done. <laughs> Um, You're going to get angry tweets from cast iron skillet enthusiasts. I know, and I, don't, <laughs> I, I do not want to bring that on myself, but I'm so, just using that as an example. Yeah. In your, this just as remind what you're saying reminds me of um, a line that you have in the essay, The Lion Whisperer. And you write that, quote, with their parallel but unknowable lives, animals offer us relationships that exist in the realm of silence and mystery, distinct from the relationships we have with others of our own species. And, you know, that, that maybe that helps explain the a uh, huge outpouring of love for Keiko maybe explains the, the, the lion whisperer himself 
Can you tell us a little bit about that man, that character you came across and what you took away from your interactions with him? This is uh, a man who lives in South Africa named Kevin Richardson, who had demonstrated an uncanny capacity for interacting with lions. There was a YouTube video of him wrestling and cuddling with lions, lions chewing on his head, playing with him as if he were a lion. And, you know, it fascinated me on on every level. First of all, how on earth does that happen? Secondly, why would you do it? Um, What, you know, everything about it was a mystery to me. And the story was very complex. It it's, uh, touches on a lot of issues about the way lions are treated in South Africa, the fact that they are bred to be um, offered up to be petted when they're cubs. And it, it's a very complicated and, um, and not easily addressed issue about what goes on with lions in in a place that we imagine lions to be wild and free. What I think is was very clear to me is that there is a different quality of an emotional connection to an animal that on one hand, it seems like it would be much more complicated. They don't have the power of language. We can't truly understand them in the case of a lion. They have the potential to kill us. But there's also a simplicity that comes, an ability to have a pure feeling about animals that we don't have towards other people. Our relationships with other people are inflected by millions and millions of factors. If we know them, if we like them, if we like the way they look, if we're mad at them for what they did 10 minutes ago, it's a constantly reassembling your emotional landscape with people, even with strangers, you're reacting to them, comparing them to people you already know or who they remind you of. With an animal, it's a pure emotion. It is I think that's why there's such a a relief, why scientists say that we get flooded with serotonin when we're with pets, because Mm -hmm. there's a way that without any compromise or complication, you can hug your dog or your dog greets you at the door, jumping up and down, wagging his tail And it feels like nothing matters except this singular emotional connection. And people really seek that. And Kevin Richardson was capable of relating to people. Um, He was married. He had children. He was a lovely, personable guy. There are some people who can't relate to other people. And they relate very well to animals. And, you know, that that is not unheard of by any means. But in his case, I think he discovered this ability to connect with animals and he loved them in a way that made him want to nurture them and cultivate that relationship beyond the bounds that would we would normally have for interacting with a wild animal. He, he, I think in their eyes was just a funny looking lion. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you saw them relate to him as if he were a lion. And I think there must be something quite extraordinary to having that feeling, particularly with an animal that could so easily kill you. And I have to say, watching him, in his enclosure with the lions and having them come up to him and throw their paws at him and knock him over. I, I was, I had my heart in my mouth most of the time. And I kept thinking, no, no, he's fine. He knows what he's doing, but I mean, they're wild animals and it it was terrifying. Didn't you have an experience of your own with pet? a lion cub? I did. Uh, I had 
uh, when I first met my husband and we were dating and we had our first Valentine's Day together, he coincidentally had met someone who was deputized to take care of exotic animals that have been seized by wildlife officers. So somebody is caught with a tiger in their apartment in New York. They have to find shelter for it. And he was somebody who did that, um, you know, regularly. And my husband was chatting with this guy on a flight and he said, well, my new girlfriend really likes animals. Do you have any animals that you could surprise her with? He said, sure, I've got a two year old lion that was just surrendered and um, is living with me. I could bring the lion and surprise her at home. I lived in Manhattan at the time. My husband told me he was taking me to see the Lion King for Valentine's Day. And I thought, oh, that's very sweet. That's a really nice Valentine's Day gift. And instead, <laughs> the doorbell rang and in walked this 200 pound lion. I won't say he was a cub. He was a young lion. He was enormous and had more power than I think I've ever been around. Um, and it was both intoxicating and terrifying. And also, as you can imagine, the biggest surprise <laughs> that anybody has ever pulled on me. Um, oh my goodness. And we spent about, a, I would say maybe 45 minutes where he was in my apartment and I got to touch him, which was amazing. And and also something that I have to say in in ordinary circumstances would never happen. I mean, unfortunately, this was an animal that had been in captivity and that will remain in captivity because it's no longer able to be returned to the wild. So I was doing something that um, kind of exceeded the bounds of what we really should be doing with wild animals, but it was also an amazing experience. I'm imagining what your neighbors in, you know, you were up in the Upper West Side or whatever it is, what they thought when that lion came up the uh, the elevator or came up the, I don't know how they got the lion. Uh, well, apartment. there uh, when we were leaving the building, I mean, the, <laughs> it was time for them to go. And we got in the elevator. I lived on the ninth floor and it was my husband and me and the lion and the three handlers. And the elevator stopped on the fifth floor, which I had never anticipated. I thought, oh, oh, my God. And the door opened and there was one of my neighbors. <laughs> and I said, do you mind waiting for the next elevator? And she said, well, I'm in a hurry. I said, but there's a lion in here. And she said, oh, all right. <laughs> oh, that's classic. That's a great one. So. What was your scariest experience in uh, the essays in this collection? Was it with the animal porter that you called the tiger lady? Well, certainly she was the scariest human that um, <laughs> that I encountered. And actually, she never let me interview her. Um, but she was um, a pretty fierce character. When I was with Kevin Richardson, he said to me, oh, you can feed the lions and just I'll show you. I'll put a piece of meat on your hand. Just hold it really flat. And I thought, ah, it sounds like the moment where my hand gets bitten off. But I did it. And I mean, I was terrified. But I also thought, let me let me do this because I'm never going to do it again in my life. I mean, I really should take this opportunity. Um, oh, and it was pretty amazing. I mean, the lion scooped it off my hand in a nanosecond, but it meant having my hand in proximity to her mouth, which was, you know, every cell in your body is telling you not to do that. <laughs> so, I and I would say going forward, it's something I will not do, but it, the opportunity to do it was fascinating. Well, I also love that description 
of you prowling around the perimeter of a tiger enclosure and getting close enough finally to a tiger so that you could smell the way you described it was its tangy, slightly sour smell. Um, was that scary for you? It was scary because this was um, my story, The Lady and the Tigers, about this woman in suburban New Jersey who had 27 pet tigers. Um, to call them pets is they were wild tigers, but she kept them in her yard in suburban New Jersey. I was visiting with a neighbor of hers because she when she had moved to New Jersey and began acquiring tigers, it was a fairly rural area. But over time, it had gotten more and more developed. And there was a subdivision that was literally surrounding her house and yard. The neighbors always wondered why there were buzzards sw uh, that would circle the property all the time. And they, they had no idea that she was feeding roadkill to the tigers. So buzzards were always looking to swoop in and finish off the deer carcasses. In any case, I went uh, over to one of the neighbors and walked to the back of his yard where it, um, where it met her property. And I suppose I expected that there would be a very high fence with barbed wire and, you know, a really secure perimeter. And it really was just a chain link fence, maybe six feet high. Uh, and I assure you that a tiger could jump over that without blinking. And I know this for a fact because a mountain lion walked through our property recently and <laughs> I said to somebody, well, I'm not worried it'll come back because we have a fence. And he said, how high is your fence? And I said, it's probably about six feet. And he said, well, you've got to be kidding. A mountain lion can clear that with, with from a standing start. So the tigers could have easily jumped over this chain link. And when the tiger walked by, I said, first of all, tigers are enormous, absolutely enormous. I mean, I'm sure most of us have seen them in zoos, seeing them up relatively close. They're shockingly big. Their paws are gigantic. Their legs are massive. And seeing it and suddenly thinking there's only this chain link fence and by the way, tigers do not like people very much. I mean, they're very ornery animals and they they don't like each other. They don't like people. I mean, they're 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 pretty foul tempered. So seeing it and suddenly thinking, oh, my God, I am I'm that close to a tiger. And he was pacing impatiently. And I sort of took a look and thought, I think I'm going to go. I saw him <laughs> and I'm leaving. Probably a good decision. <laughs> I, uh, Susan, I loved your, um, you know, your description of your move from your farm in the Hudson Valley to L.A. And I, I especially loved the section, your Eva, Eva Gabor Green Acres thing that you had going on and your chickens and your cattle and your other animals. What animals do you have in your life now in L.A.? Well, we have, um, I think, a what seems to me like a fairly paltry menagerie, um, although they take up 90 percent of my time. And that is I have two dogs and a cat. And one of my dogs is a, a pandemic puppy. He's he's oh. one year old now, but he was um, acquired during covid and. Uh, you know, it was one of the things along with baking sourdough bread that it seems like everybody in America has done during COVID. He's also a terrier. So he's uh, a very feisty, endlessly energetic creature. So he he takes up 25 hours out of 24, to <laughs> say the least. But we don't have any exotic animals. And I came very close the other day because a friend emailed me and said she had just 
found a tortoise in her backyard. She had looked around, posted signs. Nobody identified it as their pet. And she said, are you interested? And I thought, oh, I've always wanted a tortoise. And my husband put his foot down, (laughs) said, absolutely not. There are currently, my son is away at school. So right now it's just me and my husband so that we have more animals than people. We have three animals and just two people in our house. So he felt that we would be stacking the deck a little too far if we added another animal. Well, listen, though, you write so lovingly and with such affinity for chickens. You're sure you're not to have tempted to have chickens in L.A.? I'm very tempted. You know, when we moved here, we were living part time on the East Coast and part time in L.A. So having chickens was difficult in either place because I, I wasn't around to take care of them and they need daily attention. Now that we're in L.A. full time and I do have the space, chickens don't take up that much room. Some of my neighbors have chickens. The only reason that I'm very hesitant is that we also have coyotes and bobcats and hawks and a lot of animals that eat chickens. Mm -hmm. And one of the heartbreaks of raising chickens is Mm -hmm. um, you want to give them a good life and let them roam and have some freedom. But they are so vulnerable to predators. They really don't have a lot of skills to keep them safe from predators. And I learned that the hard way. I lost a lot of chickens. And anyone who raises chickens will tell you, unless you keep them in a total lockdown, you're going to lose them. And it's so it's a tough decision, but the temptation is enormous because I loved having chickens. It's so much fun. They are so they're just a delight. I love them. (laughs) Your descriptions of them are so beautiful, Susan. They're so funny and so soulful. Um, But now that I know that mountain lions can jump uh, you know, easily six foot fences at a standstill. That sounds like a really good decision not to have chickens. Um, <laughs> right. well, first of all, for our audience, please send uh, questions if you'd like uh, via our YouTube uh, link. Um, and Susan, tell us what, what are you working on now? And is there an animal in it? I am working on what feels like a million things. For one thing, I'm working on a television adaptation of the library book. And um, again, I have to say how honored I am to have gotten the California Book Award for that book. The adaptation has been a really interesting new undertaking for me. I'm somebody who writes prose. And so writing a screenplay is a very new process. I'm working on a memoir, which is something I've resisted mightily um, for whatever reason. I think because I'm I I'm so interested in the things outside of me that I've never quite believed that my own story would be interesting. But I've had I've had an interesting life, um, the kind of work I've done the backstory behind a lot of these stories is, is actually genuinely interesting. So it, it is, I'm finally surrendering to the idea of doing a memoir and it's been fun. It's a great challenge. It's a, I think a great sort of mental and emotional exercise for me to try something that I felt like, no, 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 I'm never going to do a memoir. So of course Being who I am, my first response to no, no, no is yes, yes, yes. So here I am working on a memoir (laughs) and I'm going to be launching um, a column soon on the New Yorker website, which I'm very excited about. And I can't yet reveal what it'll be about, but it'll be uh, it's going to be very interesting. Great. I can't wait for it. I can't resist asking you this question. First of all, super happy library book is going to be a TV series. Who is going to play you or will you be a character in the series? 
We know oh, Meryl well, played you before. That's hard to top, of course. But. Yes, of course. I mean, once you've had that <laughs> experience, it's kind of hard to have any other. And as I first wrote the adaptation, and this maybe tells you a lot about why it's so challenging for me to think about doing a memoir. Initially, I thought, well, I don't need to be a character in this. This this is all about the library. But then in the course of writing, it became very evident that the story made sense having, as I am in the book, um, the sort of guide through this world and the story of the fire and the story of the library today, that it made perfect sense for that character to exist. So we have a wish list of who will play me and oh come on, please know, tell us. All all my <laughs> favorite actresses. Um my my number one pick would be Julianne Moore. So yes. we're we're seeing what happens with that. And I mean I would watch her in anything. So you can yes. imagine that I would be thrilled to see her in this. But we'll see. Um, you know, still some uh, work to be done, but I'm really enthusiastic about it and excited about it. Oh, that's just great. I cannot wait. We did get a question. What other writers do you um, do you like who are currently writing about animals? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, well, there's a wonderful book by a writer named Cy Montgomery that's called Soul of an Octopus. That's fantastic. Helen McDonald writes beautifully about animals, about birds in particular, H is for hawk and so forth. Um, Mary Roach has a new book about animals that I haven't yet read, only because I've been consumed with getting my own book out, out into the world. But she's always fantastic. She is. She's um, a great writer. And, you know, I think that... Uh, I'm most drawn to people who don't come at writing about animals from the lens of science or zoology, but rather from the more journalistic um, observational perspective and the literary perspective. So th those are a few just off the top of my head. And there, mm -hmm. I'm sure are many others. Those are great, great choices. And what about, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that, uh, uh, you know, you sometimes you watch YouTube uh, uh, video or this stuff on YouTube about animals. Is there anything you'd recommend to us? Anything that has really captured your imagination? Well, one th a few things. I think anybody and this isn't on YouTube, but anybody who hasn't seen my octopus teacher <sighs> is in for a treat. It's really one of the most amazing films I've ever seen about an animal and uh, really incredible. I also write in, in the book, uh, uh, I have a chapter about pandas and I mention uh, the Chinese scientist who spends time in, with wild pandas and there's a very funny story about his interaction with a mother panda and her cub and that's available on youtube um and it is you know i think sometimes those um you know the the highly produced sophisticated animal documentaries are amazing and wonderful sometimes you catch these these small moments that are, you know, that came about almost accidentally that are magnificent. And I think YouTube is probably 90% animal videos from what I can tell. 80% of that 90% are cat videos. <laughs> I mean, somebody said, would YouTube even exist if cat videos weren't a thing? And I would say probably not. Um, but we do seem to love to see images of animals. I, I would say my camera roll is a good three quarters pictures of my dogs and cat. And I have many, many, many pictures of my dogs and cat. <laughs> a few of but, my kids and mostly my dog. <laughs> yeah, same here. And of course, yeah. because I'm a teenager, he doesn't let me take pictures of him anymore. So I, I have no choice. But we do, this is a... a 
a fact of humankind almost since the beginning of film and photography, which is that we like looking at images of animals and animals were the earliest stars of the earliest films that there's something enduring about our curiosity about them and our, our joy in looking at them. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Susan, it has been such a pleasure to be with you and hear all of the uh, different things you're working on, the incredible adventures you've had with animals, the um, a sensitive and funny way you've written about them. And I, I really can't thank you enough for this conversation. Um, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for hosting it. And of course, I want to encourage everyone to purchase a copy of Susan Orlean's absolutely wonderful book on animals, uh, wherever books are sold. I also want to encourage everyone to become a member of the Commonwealth Club. Visit the club site at www.commonwealthclub.org to learn how to become a member. This program and others like it will be posted soon on the website. I'm Julia Flynn Seiler, and this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned.